Buenas and half a day. Good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. The Committee on Education, Air Transportation, and Statistics Research and Planning. And with the uh, assistance of General Government Operations, Appropriations, and Housing Chair, we'll now convene this joint informational hearing. It is now 3.12 in the afternoon. For the record and in accordance with open government law, public notices were sent out via email to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets on Janu January 29th, 2019, and the second notice on February 1st, 2019. With me today is uh, my vice chair, uh, Senator Terlahi, uh, Senator Luis Munia, Senator Jim Moylan, Senator Paris, Senator Joseph Augustine, Senator Clint Rogel, and Senator Lee. Thank you for being here. The purpose of this informational briefing is to help the committee and the general public understand the challenges and concerns regarding the GDOE budget and to ensure that the quality of education that our students are receiving are adequate education. Because this hearing will address both the budgets and the effects thereof, I'd like to thank Senator Joseph Augustine, Chairman of the Appropriations Committee, for convening this joint hearing. Uh, Senator St. Augustine, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I'd like to first bring calm to the Board of Edu to the Education Department of Education. Your budget hearing has been moved to March 5th, 9 o'clock. So uh, I'm, I'm going to safely assume that as a result of this information hearing, you'll make some amendments or whatever on your budget and then submit it as soon as possible to the Office of Finance and Budget. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. We have with us today Mr. Mark Mendiola, Superintendent Mr. John Fernandez, uh, GFT Representative Sanjay Sharma, Ms. Stacy Uggen, I'm sorry, Ms. Stacy Sahagan, uh, Mr. Joe Sanchez, Ms. Isabel Lujan, Ms. Kelly Sokola, Dr. Sokola, uh, Mr. Ike Santos, Ms. Taling Taitagui, Isa Baza, Taitano. <laughs> Forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm sorry, I cannot read this. Do you know who that is? Was he, um, Men Mr. Mendoza? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's okay. He's not here. And <laughs> all right. Very good. If I missed anyone, Ms. and Mrs. Maria Gutierrez, thank you. Uh, as a chairperson for the committee, for the education committee, we are de I'm dedicated to securing the resources necessary for our students, as every child is entitled to an adequate education. As we move through this term, our, fo our, our focus will not be strictly financial. We would also like to collaborate with GDOE, teachers, students, parents, administrators and overall leadership on the curriculum and instruction. We look at the cost of textbooks, but we must also look at the content. We, uh, I'd like to encourage that we prioritize our students' educational experience and examine our own standards. We must ensure that our standards and our instruction are in the best interest of the children. I understand that in recent years, GDOE has switched from the SAT-10 test to regional assessments, the ACT Aspire, and the curriculum a student-based assessment. We'd also like to know if that has been an effective change for the system. Our island and our culture are important to our community and in turn, our education system should reflect that importance. I understand that the detailed budget documents for GDOE budget proposal came in this week. So some of our committee members uh, may have not had ample time to review them. However, the purpose of this informational hearing will cover this specific discussion on the general budget and the impacts of budget co uh, cuts. For my colleagues, a copy of the budget transmittal letter, the Guam Education Board budget resolution, and Schedule A has been included as part of your packets. I'd like to now um, invite the superintendent or Mr. Mark Mendiola to give us a, a, a statement. Thank you. Afternoon, Bona Senator Sidus Masi, Palestine Opportunidad, Namamotu Ham, Palestine Department of Education. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of the Department of Education. Uh, I appreciate the sentiments shared by the Chair of the Education Committee and also the Chair of Appropriations. 
prior to us having a meeting here, we've actually had an opportunity to sit down with Senator uh, Talina Nelson, chair of the committee, along with um, our uh, former chairman of the board, uh, Senator Joseph Augustine, uh, regarding our, our budget uh, submission to the, um, to the Guam legislature. So uh, with me, I have, of course, our vice chair, Ms. Maria Gutierrez. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. James Luhan, uh, Ms. Lou Beneventi, and Dr. Ron McNich, who make the complement of the board. Currently, we have four vacancies on the board, and we're anticipating that the governor will be appointing uh, four new members to the board, uh, three that will fill specific uh, target uh, uh, demographics, and then one to fill uh, an elected seat that was not uh, filled because basically no one uh, uh, ran for that position. So we anticipate a full complement of board as soon as possible. So I'm pretty sure that the uh, names will be transmitted to you, to you folks for consideration. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of that. Uh, so I'll read my testimony. Uh, Hoffity, Vice Speaker Nelson and Chairman St. Augustine. Early today, the Guam, uh, earlier today, the Guam Post uh, published a letter to the editor penned by, my, uh, penned by the superintendent and myself on behalf of the Guam Department of Education. We entitled it, the 343 million question in education, which reflects the total amount requested in our budget for fiscal year 2020. The reason for writing this letter was to provide a more public explanation of the budget and how we arrived at what some people may think may be an unrealistic request, given our current government's budgetary challenges. Let me say first that I understand that the government of Guam is facing financial challenges. And at the same time, I want to take a moment to ensure that we all recall that the Organic Act of Guam identifies public education as a fundamental mandate for our government. It reads, the government of Guam shall provide an adequate public educational system of Guam. I also want us to recall Public Law 28-45, the Every Student is Entitled to an Adequate Education Act, introduced by Senator Bob Kalitsky and passed by a unanimous vote of the legislature in 2005. It clarifies the 14 points or mandates that define what an adequate education means. Failure to meet these mandates subjects all of us as public officials involved in education to a potential lawsuit by any public student who wishes to step forward. That's how important education is within the laws of our island. So we come before you today requesting $343 million for fiscal year 2020, not because the government of Guam is flush with resources, but because the government of Guam has told us to prioritize education as a fundamental component of our community. This number, this number was reached through a very extensive process that started out in the schools and in our divisions back in September. It involved public hearings with our school stakeholders. We went under close review by our, super, uh, went under close review by our superintendent and then came to the Guam Education Board for several work sessions before our final vote was approved. It represents the request of the people at the front lines, and we as members of the GEB are proud to present it to you for your review and approval. We have been through a tough year in education. Faced with a threatened 19 million in cuts, we were the first agency to make immediate adjustments and to go out to our stakeholders and to directly discuss, uh, to discuss the impacts and listen for alternatives and new ideas. We have worked hard to deal with the challenges facing us in 2019, as the superintendent will share. Now we look to you for your help in mitigating further reductions to education and figuring out how we can ensure that more resources are provided to our schools and our students. I thank you for your leadership, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you uh, in dealing with the challenges faced in the Department of Education. And so that's my written testimony, but I want to also talk as a parent uh, because I have four students in the public school system, and I know how important this work is, and I know there's a lot of people around this table who realize that. My wife is also a teacher at the public school system, so I'm vested in this, just like a lot of people around this table. So um, I like to solve problems. I like to figure out how we can come to, uh, to, to some of the challenges that we face. One of the things that I've noticed since I've been on the board is shifting in the middle of a school year is very difficult. And sometimes, you know, when the red flags co up that you know, perhaps we're not gonna be able to receive you know, the anticipated revenue or we're not gonna be able to receive or realize what was budgeted or appropriated by the legislature. The Department of Education has to make those necessary adjustments. And we've been very transparent. We've gone to our villages, we've gone to our community schools, we've actually even addressed 
attendance areas, we tried to do our best to also provide solutions to the challenges by offering alternative uh, ways in which we could uh, generate revenue for the Department of Education. And so we come before you today in a, a collaborative spirit uh, with positive energy. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of, of the school year. In a couple of months, we'll be seeing you at graduations to witness the next generation of leaders that will be walking across the stage receiving their diplomas. And our board's priority, and we've given this direction to the superintendent, is the safety of our students to ensure that we have a sound, uh, uh, a very robust curriculum, and that we have our facilities are safe and adequate to meet the needs of our students. And if you look at and you see the budget that we're presenting to you uh, before you, it's based on the 14 points. And that has been the guiding principle in which we basically put the dollar figure to that. And oftentimes, uh, folks ask us, what is, that, what is that 14 points? Well, it was a creation of the legislature and that's basically the guiding document until it gets changed or until it gets further review uh, by this August body, then we will then you know, address accordingly. But uh, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I know that there are some new senators around the table, of course, we'd love to hear from you your perspectives as to how uh, we can generate ideas so that we can improve the Department of Education. Our board is, uh, works collaboratively with our superintendent. We've had good relationships with the uh, GFT they are at the table. We have representative stake stakeholders on the table. We allow them the opportunity to present issues that may be out there. We have the Island Board of Governing Students, who's also uh, one of the advisors is our vice chair. And we're actually including them in some of the policy de decision making and actually helping us craft policy as it pertains to student discipline uh, issues or other issues that the students may think uh, is important to, uh, for, for the board to consider. We have the GFT also give their report, and, and along with that, the superintendent, we encourage him to continue his dialogue with the president of the GFT. Um, and we also have the mayor's council represented. So we have the mayors uh, talking about the uh, cleaning of our facilities, uh, you know, the yard maintenance and things of that nature. So um, we're trying to triangulate it and align our stars to ensure that the department is operating as efficiently as possible. Uh, I know that there's some areas that we can definitely tighten up and I know the superintendent, uh, along with his team, provides us a guidance so that we can ask the tough questions. And so when we come before you, we will be able to answer that uh, questions. But this budget process has allowed us to really look at the overall finances of the government. This is the second year that I've sat on uh, chairing the budget uh, committee and usually request about this amount. And then we anticipate the number that's coming down and then we plan accordingly on the spending priorities. But we wanted to paint a picture of what is that 343 million, what would that mean for the Department of Education? And it's pretty much the mandates of the people of Guam to the law. And so um, definitely there's some challenges and we're up to uh, listening to your questions and, and, and provide the responses and that's what we're here for. So Sidus Masi, thank you Senator for also allowing your staff to uh, participate in our meetings. Uh, I think having them at the table uh, also uh, and in the discussion uh, allows us to kind of work together and uh, understand the legislation that may be presented. So, Sidhu Smasi for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mendiola. Uh, Mr. Superintendent? Um, thank you, uh, Vice Speaker and Senator Sanogsi and members of the committee. Um, just want to recognize I do have de my deputies as, as well who are here. Um, in the event that the conversation is, is, you know, goes broader in scope than just the budget, I wanted them to be here to be able to be able to provide timely response uh, to any issue that might come up. So, uh, in in the event that that uh, an issue comes up, if I can, um, if that's okay, I would just ask them to come up and take a seat to be able to respond. Um, the two uh, subjects on the table are the FY 2019 challenges and then the 20 request. And uh, we submitted that that budget request on Jan by January 30th as the de deadline uh, in law requires. But I understand that uh, we'll have this opportunity today to talk a little bit about the budget. And then as I mentioned to you earlier, should there be any need to follow up, uh, provide more detailed information and update things, then um, Senator San Augustine has you know, indicated that we'll have an opportunity to do that again in March. So uh, hopefully with, with that in, in, in mind, we'll be able to answer the questions and provide uh, the necessary information for you to be able to make your decisions on the budget. 
I'll just go ahead and jump into the FY 2019 challenges. We did have the opportunity to brief the Vice Speaker and Senator St. Augustine, as well as uh, the, the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, um, just, I mean, last month, so I'm right early in the, the term. And we wanted to raise this just to make sure everybody understood um, you know, where, the department's, uh, where the department was in terms of the FY19 budget. So yes, indeed, uh, FY19 is a challenge. Um, you know, we are doing our best to adjust to the, the budget situation that we have had since 2018, early in 2018. Last year when we, uh, when we approved our FY19 request, it was around the same time that we also received the directive to begin to cut as a result of, of the federal tax cuts. So we've been dealing with this already for the past 12 months, and, uh, and I think we've taken a very proactive approach to try to be responsible as an agency, but also try to protect our core mission in education. Uh, but that cha those challenges still continue today. So uh, to put some context on it, in FY 2018, and you have a copy of the testimony, uh, you should if you want to follow along. In 2018, DOE received an appropriation of 237.2 million dollars. And that's not counting uh, the funding for charter schools, which was $8.1 million in that year. So 237.2 just for DOE. And as a result of the federal tax cuts, um, BBMR instructed DOE to reduce proposed expenditures by $19 million. And that was last January. So immediately at that time, we began to proactively identify um, the budget savings that we could. And we, we got to about $12.2 million dollars. And we did that by freezing the central office and administrator hiring, reducing contractual services, de delaying the expansion of pre our pre-kindergarten program, delaying the onboarding of substitutes until uh, the following fiscal year, October 1st, and then providing more flexibility to use uh, funds to cover core operations. Expecting to, cut more, to have to cut more at the time, we went out to our villages to meet with stakeholders to inform them of our efforts, seek ideas and suggestions, and share with them the tougher decisions that were ahead. At that time, it was including the possibility of furloughs. Uh, we were grateful that we did not need to make further reductions based on the action taken by the legislature um, to pass the fiscal realignment plan and uh, submitted by the governor. Uh, that also included some of the revenue solutions to get us through the rest of the fiscal year. So in fiscal year 2019, we received an appropriation of $219.9 million. Uh, that's a reduction of 17.2 from where we were in fiscal year 2018. And then in early January, again, uh, DOE was informed by BBMR that we would need to find an additional 4.8 uh, million. I had said 4.7 is a rounding error. It was 4.8 million to cut due to the issues related to the property tax provisions of the Appropriations Act, uh, and that which increased the tax rate for real estate improvements on properties valued at $1 million or more. So this additional $4.8 million in required reduction takes us to a total of $21.9 million that we would have to reduce from where we started in FY18 to FY19. So that is between 9 and 10% of our DOE uh, total budget and having to adjust to that in the last uh, 12 months. So to absorb, so I'm sorry, that, that, that's an error, but it's $22 million. So to absorb that, we you know, I kind of laid out in the table on page two um, how we believe we're, we can get um, the majority of these, these funds. So right now, you know, we, in the Appropriations Act, there were three government-wide provisions that were put in there that are still in place. So one is the government-wide freeze and reclassifications, um, government-wide reduced retirement contributions, and the government-wide freeze and salary increments. And you'll see those three, the savings that, uh, that uh, reflect DOE's savings from those uh, initiatives. But beyond that, because we had time since early 2018 to try to make further adjustments, uh, we've succeeded in negotiating uh, longer term contractual savings uh, for custodial uh, services, solid waste, copier, um, HVAC, our, our air conditioning, uh, maintenance and repairs. And so you'll see the savings uh, associated with that. We um, delayed expansion of our pre-K program once more uh, for $1.1 million in savings. We are extending our hiring freeze for non-teaching positions. Uh, to, that's, that we anticipate will be a $3.8 million savings. Reduced uh, substitutes. Typically we budget substitutes at 10% of total classroom teachers. So we basically that's about half of where it needs to be um, for a savings of $1.8 million. The, um, 
these next three items, we uh, get limited gaming funds that are supposed to go to sports facilities for the most part. Uh, we, we get passport fees that are supposed to support library operations and then healthy future funds to operate um, as well, which does nursing supplies and health and physical uh, education activities. When we say redirect, I mean, really we're talking about just having the flexibility to use that should we need those funds uh, down you know, later on in the fiscal year. The, um, then, then the last two, um, in order to try to get to as much savings as possible, would, to, would be to repeat the delay in hiring of substitutes this coming year uh, until October 1st and then limit school facility use after hours and over the summer uh, if needed. So that savings right there is about $17.2 million. Um, this is, th th now this of course came after a review of you know, all the possible options that uh, made sense while trying to protect our core uh, value, our core op our mission of teaching and learning in our classrooms. So we um, developed those, we had the budget office cost them out, met with the board and tried to come up with uh, steps that, you know, things that we could do to try to reach that savings target. Um, I, I did want to take an opportunity to say that while we've worked hard to limit the impact of budget reductions, I do share the concern that our partners, are the Guam Federation of Teachers, um, had regarding some of the administrative provisions. So, uh, namely, the salary increment freeze and the reclassification freeze. For DOE, reclassifications mostly impact our teachers who are in the midst of attaining uh, further education and their advanced degrees. And the freeze on reclassifications delays our ability to compensate them for their investment in becoming stronger and more effective teachers. With regard to the salary increment freeze, uh, this is both an impact on the financial side, so yes, it does help financially, but uh, the concern is really with regard to employee morale. I think at the end of the day, when you have a, a tougher budget situation, everybody who is working and who is, you know, is in those positions are bearing more of the brunt, more, more of the burden, more of the responsibility to try to get through the year. And so you get that sense when you go out and talk to your stakeholders, everybody wants to pitch in, and then you say, but, but on top of that, don't expect your salary increment. So we recognize that, um, I know that's something that the GFT had put out there to see if there's any relief that could be provided, and, uh, and we, we, uh, we share that concern. Um, so $17.2 million, uh, that leaves the, this $4.8 million that we weren't planning for um, that uh, has to do with the property tax issue and the Appropriations Act. So we uh, understand that Bill 4-35 has been introduced to amend the tax levy on real property improvements uh, to, um, to address that situation, and we strongly urge the senators to pass the bill as soon as possible to help assist DOE in holding off on additional measures uh, that might infect our schools. The following reductions uh, have been discussed uh, with uh, the board and with our team. Uh, should, should we have to try to find $4.8 million? These were the next issues that were, next items that were on the table. Uh, we, uh, so we do have DOI funds that were recently committed to support the, some of the pre-development work in Simon Sanchez. That's $2 million. Um, we have tried to protect the textbook funds from being impacted this year. Last year they were impacted. This year um, we had held them in advance trying not to have to go two years without purchasing textbooks. That's $1.5 million. Um, we, you know, the earlier table talked about limiting some of this after school use. We would probably have to go to full, um, you know, shutdown of schools after the school day to try to achieve most of those things are like utility savings. And then looking at freezing school level vacancies, which is actually where we get into that tough part of uh, not being able to fill. These are the teaching positions and some of the support positions. So we're not trying to touch that right now. We're looking at more, you know, administrator central office positions, trying to hold tight on those. Um, just getting to that, that extra 4.8 is, is a challenge. So we do uh, ask the legislator to, if there, if there is relief ahead, we would you know, definitely appreciate that. Um, we do appreciate, I think the other issue that will come up in FY19 and always comes up in the hearings, so I'll go ahead and put it on the table, is that in addition to the budgetary challenges, there's always this concern about cash flow. So obviously cash flow is not just an issue for our agency, um, but it is something that does affect how we operate. We currently receive around $3.65 million weekly from the Department of Administration. And that allows us every two weeks to meet our biweekly uh, pay, uh, uh, pay period, meet our payroll. And uh, that leaves us a minimal amount to try to cover vendor payments. 
So usually early in the year, that's that's the that's probably what we're you know that's what we expect to get that 3.65 every week, and it's um, this impacts our ability to keep up with payments to vendors, and um, and something that we have to kind of juggle until we get later into the fiscal year. Relief usually comes around February and April, when uh, the TEF funds kick in. So I think in prior years um, we have been able to negotiate some upfront payment of TEF that could get reconciled you know, down the road when the revenues came in. Uh, now, um, working with DOA, their position on this is to wait until those actual revenues materialize. At that point, then we would get those funds. And so we typically have to wait till February or April to collect those funds and then try to catch up with uh, our obligations. So that's how cash flow uh, works for us. And the other, the other issue is once we get past that point, we're looking towards the end of the fiscal year, trying to ensure and maximize the ability to uh, have cash released in line with our appropriation. So uh, we, were, we had a question, I believe, uh, in our earlier session about where we were left in FY18. So um, we experienced a shortfall of $14.1 million. Now that exceeds the allotted 12.3 million that was already accounted for in the fiscal realignment plan. So we anticipated 12.3 as part of the, of the realignments, but uh, there was addi an additional $1.8 million that did not materialize for DOE. And so that is, that's where we ended up with the last fiscal year. Um, you know, our concern about the shortfalls is that, you know, we've, we've been an agency that's had to deal with those shortfalls of, over a period of years. And I know you, you recall the TEF discussions because uh, earlier, um, earlier um, 2013, 14, and 15, we were projected to get TEF and the TEF, the TEF revenues never materialized at the levels that were projected. So every time there was a shortfall in TEF, we would eat, eat some of that shortfall. And it got to the point where I believe we were about 15 to $18 million in accumulated shortfall over that period of years. So we've worked very hard to try to, um, to, try to address that because what that translates into a lot in basically is vendor issues. So we've tried to catch up um, as much as possible. January last year, we were pretty current. I, I think uh, more than half of our, our vendor, pay, vendor payables were below 60 days, which is great for us. Um, but uh, I think at this point, we have about, at this uh, snapshot in time, we have about $8 million in account uh, in, uh, vendor payables and about f five, five to $6 million are over that 60 day limit. So um, that's kind of reflects the pressure that, we, that we're getting in this budget situation and then with the cash flow that we get. So I think every agency understands that, but uh, that's how it, um, it affects us. Our biggest vendors, of course, are gonna be our cleaning services, our food services, and so, uh, G, well, GPA, of course, and GWA. So uh, for when, when we're running dry on cash, we constantly negotiate with our vendors to try to uh, get some relief. But that's, uh, that's why Tolling's here, to try to make things, keep the trains running. Okay, so I think that pretty much covers the FY19. I mean, I think we explained this when we did our briefings, but I, did, I, did, I do agree it's, it's good to put this out there for the general public to understand as we go through uh, the year, and I think uh, support the, you know, making this transparent to all the stakeholders who are wondering about about the situation. So, uh, getting into FY 2020, uh, we did get a submit a request of 343.9 million dollars, and uh, I think the uh, the chairman explained how we get to that number, and a lot of it is guided by not just the board's priorities, but the priorities uh, set forth in the uh, Adequate Education Act and the 14 point structure and trying to align to make sure that we're meeting that. It also comes out of, the, of, of our schools. So the process is the schools are the ones who start, the schools and divisions start the budget process off you know, first. They're the ones who go out, they have their public hearings, they submit uh, those, uh, their requests you know, to us after they're able to share with their stakeholders. They come to uh, the superintendent's office, we sit down with every school and every division. At that point, uh, we, we don't, we're not in the, in the cutting phase. It's mostly a lot of justification, but um, a lot of also ensuring that we're removing redundancies and making sure that we're accounting for the request in the right place. So for instance, a lot of schools will come forward with capital improvement requests, and we typically consolidate those uh, and put them under the capital improvements uh, you know, projects or capital improvements unit. Same thing with some of the facilities needs. So there may be some of that movement, movement into the right category. But for the most part, when it gets to the board, um, it's gone through that process of screening and tries trying to clean it up. 
and then it gets to the board and the board has an opportunity to have, uh, and they typically do have numerous work sessions to understand what's being requested and then uh, take their, their action to approve the budget and submit it. Now this year, you'll note, uh, wanna note that um, that number does not include the charter school budgets. So, we, but, uh, so the way the law works around charter schools is that the charter schools are supposed to submit the budgets to DOE and then we're supposed to submit the, the, the budget as part of the DOE budget is what the law says. Uh, in the past, it's actually gone through several, sev several different processes and I think it's why we've worked so closely with uh, to try to get the uh, budgets uh, separated. So, because the way it works now is kind of a pass through. They give it to the Charter School Council, they don't amend it. They give it to me, I'm supposed to give it right to the board. The board's not really authorized to do anything with it. So, pass it. so in the past we said, why don't we just give it, you just give it directly to the legislature. If you give it to us, we'll just send it to the legislature. And I think the board you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't have a role and so um, it doesn't make sense to put it in a budget that they're approving. So we did the same uh, thing this year. We, we did receive it by, I think, January. We submitted our budget on the 25th. The 28th is when we got their uh, submissions from the three charter schools, and we went ahead and forwarded them under separate cover. So you'll receive those. I want to say that on the record just because we did get a concern from a charter school about whether or not it was supposed to be a part or not a part. And we said, look, you know, this is something that we need to work out, but that's how we've submitted it before. This is why it doesn't make sense to vote on it and integrate it into the budget but we're gonna transmit it anyways before the deadline, uh, but it is probably something that the legislature might be able to help with uh, going forward. And, uh, you wanna pause there or, okay. I think the other issue is, um, and you know, so you'll see the budget as aligned with the 14 points. Um, I noted the charter school issues. The other big piece there is, um, there's, there actually are two big pieces in the budget that make up a big chunk of the request. And I'll go ahead and, and be, um, put that forward. One is textbooks, which makes up a $17 million uh, cost if we're looking at the one textbook per child um, ma mandate, as well as uh, looking at all the textbooks that have been adopted. So typically, the, the Appropriations Act includes $1.5 million for um, textbooks. In the past, and this has gone on for many years, in the past, we've just gone ahead and requested $1.5 million every year as part of the budget request. Um, it happened uh, maybe three or four years ago. Um, it became a, a media story, and one of the one of your former colleagues maybe has said, "Well, they never asked for the well, the money needed to get all these textbooks." So that's why we made a decision. We know it's, that it's been 1.5 for many years, but we wanted to just capture the entire amount uh, so that there is a clarity as to what that means uh, based on the backlog of uh, adopted textbooks and the number of, ch of children we have. But, that, but as you can see, that takes the $17 million of a $343 million request. The other issue is the facilities. These facilities, so you'll see in the budget, uh, about $21 million are actually capital improvement projects. These are major projects that probably should be financed, you know, as they would be in, in most jurisdictions. Someone issues a bond, you, deal, you make these improvements and you pay for the improvements over the life of the asset. But we don't have the ability, and the government hasn't, you know, has limited borrowing capacity right now. We don't have borrowing capacity right now. So the two ways in which we are dealing with our uh, capital needs, our major capital needs, is one, it's through um, the lease leasebacks, where we're able to offload some of those responsibilities to a private developer, uh, as you've seen in some of our schools, and this is the case with Simon Sanchez. The other piece is... Um, the other piece is you just pay for it as you go, which is why you see a $20 million request that really is more of a something that you should be paying debt service on instead of trying to pay it all in one year. But, um, you know, when we got the deferred uh, maintenance report from the Army Corps of Engineers, it was about $90 million that was identified. And so as part of that request, we sort of broke it into, you know, if we're going to do all the restrooms or the canopies, here's what it would cost, and uh, try to do it in phases. So the phase... You know, one phase of that we estimated to be about $20 million, and uh, it aligns with what the schools are requesting. But I just want to point it out there that it's a, that's a strange part of the budget. They had such a big facility request for projects that should probably normally be, you know, you know the subject of bond, of borrowing, so that it pays for it over time instead of all up front. So uh, with that said, um, uh, happy to, uh, we just want to put that out there. I have been pushing for a dedicated funding source for facilities. 
Um, I know it got caught in this whole debate over new taxes and cuts and all of that last year, but it really wasn't meant to, it was meant to sort of stand on its own. And the idea was, given that we recognize there's a facility needs, if we could find um, a stream of funding that we could lock away, it would really create opportunities for us to, to move forward and to actually leverage that funding. So we've talked to the governor about this. Uh, we talked to the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, with, their, with their funding ab ability. If we are able to lock away a stream of funding, and it could be through new revenues, it could be through revenues that you save, you know, that you don't need as much to, uh, from existing projects. Uh, but if you lock it away, uh, they're telling us that uh, we could possibly, you know, use that and leverage that uh, with the support of, um, of a federal agency. So USDA is a partner that we've been working with. And uh, I think the last thing I heard, they issued a 40-year 40, a 40 loan for a 3% uh, 3 interest rate. So, you know, favorable financing would definitely help us uh, maximize our resources. So things, so ideas like that, we would definitely want to work with you and to see if we could uh, get your support and find a solution. And um, that would take care of a major part of what typically shows up in our budget. So with that, um, I'm happy to you know, have the discussion and take questions. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Just to clarify, in uh, FY 2018, you were appropriated $237.2 million. And then you were asked by BBMR yeah. um, to reduce expenditures by another $19 million. However, you found a room by proactively identifying $12.2 million you can further reduce. Right. So that bring bring brought you down like about seven. $225 million mm -hmm. in appropriation and is what you received for FY18. So in FY18, it brought us, so we, we ended up with the Fiscal Alignment Act uh, recognizing that $12.3 million was the cut that we should be taking. Uh, but at the end of the day, when we got the cash, we were still $1.8 million short Shorts. of that mark. So we got 14.1, 12.3 we expected. Okay. It's that remainder, and so we've, we're, we're raising it as well with the uh, with the governor and lieutenant governor to let them know. Okay. But that's something that it would definitely have helped. And then, what was your expenditure for FY18? What was the expenditure for FY18? For FY18, about that amount, right? Yeah. So it, 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 I mean, so our ex, ex, expenditures would be around the same amount, yeah. What What is the amount that you expended in FY18? So. I don't let me the total expenditure I think it was 343 million that's our appropriate no, that's our request that was your ex, uh, the expenditure for FY18 what was that for FY18 you got it it was about 2.2 looking at are, are you sh are you sure okay well, we'll come oh, back yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah, um, this was in a previous meeting that we, we met, and I asked you, how did right. you find that extra revenue source? Because we read somewhere that the expenditure uh, met the initial budget request and without the cuts. And right. so uh, that was when we proceeded to talk about your federal grants right. and the different federal grants right. that you had. Right. So we'll get a, a concrete answer for okay. the public um, in a future uh, hearing. Um, the third, I'd like to ask another question. You have, you know, based on statute, there are the 14 points that uh, we must meet to ensure that they are funded. And in the 13th point, it says on 1 GCA, Chapter 7, Section L, Number 13, at least 100, and this is the 13th point, at least 180 instructional days or its equivalents, including makeup days, each school year with school years ending it no later than 30 days following the end of the calendar school year. Uh, 13A, the 180 instructional days are to be converted into equivalent hours by computing elementary school days at five hours per day for a total of 900 hours per year and by computing middle school and high school days at seven hours per day for a total of 1,260 hours per year and uh, 13B, scheduled Easter and Christmas breaks shall not be included in makeup days or hours. Right. I'm sure the teachers are grateful for that. Um, so on the 13th point, I just want to understand, uh, we have the fiscal year 2020 spending plan personnel by adequate education 
Act. And in the 13th point, um, you list uh, some positions, perhaps like the superintendent, um, deputy superintendents, personnel uh, assistants. So I, I'm just wondering, where was the reasoning, right, to include um, this specific staffing within the 13th point? How, what is the justification to meet the law requirement for the 180 day, 180 instructional days? So you have accounting technicians, right. administrative okay. officers. So we're just looking at 180 days, right? right? So I'm thinking these are, I'm thinking accounting technicians probably work year round. So it's 365 right. days. Right. And so can you just please Understood. explain a little bit of So what I think part of that's uh, maybe an interpretive uh, discussion about how to interpret the 13th point and what that Which requires. Which is why I'm asking you how right. to interpret it. Yeah, so I'm gonna let you know that our, our interpret, so interpretation really is, I mean, every other point is pretty specific. So probably pretty easy to, I think in the, in the 13 point, um, especially as we're doing an alignment of our budget, uh, we interpret it to mean what is it, you know, what are, what are the positions that we have in place that end up um, supporting the ability for us to keep the, the, uh, you know, the school year running on schedule on time. So it is almost your administrative uh, catch-all for a number of the roles that play, you know, in the back offices and so forth. Yeah. So it's not really a direct, I mean, it's really a direct alignment, is, but it's a, uh, so it's, a, have, it's a category that captures a lot of the administrative yeah. functions that support the schools. Because you even have graphic artists, technicians, and the com combination of two fill for this 13th point Definitely. is 120,000. The reason why I'm asking this, yeah. right, is because uh, uh, Senator Klitschke put out a, uh, I don't know right. if it was an op-ed or an, an opinion that if the government doesn't meet these 13 points, then, then sue the government, right? Right. And right. so I wanna make sure that there's proper justification for including these positions if we're providing funding for these, these I'm sorry, if the government doesn't complete the 14 points, then sue the government. So specifically, I'm honing in on the 13 points because there's a, um, it's kind of open for interpretation. Correct. And so if there's a way that we can ensure that we meet statute and uh, perhaps we are more specific on right. what the 13th point encapsulates, because it has graphic artists, technicians, right. and, and you know, like it's kind of like I, I think if we uh, can close the loop for the right. open what, interpretation. Then right. I think what you're asking for is uh, for our interpretation yes. of the 13th point, and because if, I think this is all it has in the law. So I'm happy to provide the how we view that 13th point and why it captures so many of these back office functions. Okay. Okay. All right. Understood. Very good. Uh, thank you. And then uh, the second question I have for you is the um, the utility costs for each school, right? And, I, I, and this is everything that we discussed about. Yeah, that, that's right? fine. That was good. So I'm not trying to blindsight you here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we discussed the utility disparity in, in some of the schools that have similar enrollments. Uh, for example, Simon Sanchez High School, uh, the cost per student is uh, 1000 uh, excuse me, eight, there's 1,750 students, and then the cost per student is $6,024. And then you have, um, you have HB Price Elementary School that has 733 students, and then the cost per student is 6,782. Right. And so can you just please um, perhaps share with the public some of the proactive measures you are looking, the DOE is looking to do to sure. uh, fix the utility disparity and um, yeah. some okay. of the initiatives yeah. you are looking to do. Uh, great, great question. You know, uh, with the board, we, we've actually, through the superintendent, we just had a presentation yesterday conducted by GPA. Uh, they came in, they had their uh, consultant come in and talk about the utility consumption and what does it cost per and so there is a pilot program that they're starting in some of the, uh, in a, in one of the schools, and or, or, uh, three schools, sorry. And um, the, the other issue is that uh, we've seen a reduction in, in consumption, but then the, the rate on the other side goes high. So even though we're saving on power consumption, the rate uh, actually continues to stay up at that level. And so the superintendent will explain that a little bit more in detail. 
But for us, uh, you know, we've had also uh, one of our, uh, there was a pilot program that was supposed to be started at one of the uh, leaseback schools. It's a solar, uh, solar panel uh, project that was supposed to be started that's been tied up with, uh, at the Attorney General's office. We're trying to get that resolved, uh, see exactly what it is that, uh, that is needed to, to ensure that uh, we get the best deal. But uh, I think this thing has been in the Attorney General's office for over two years. Four years. Or, or four years, four years. But since I've been on board, I, you know, I'm well aware of that. But we, we you know, the department at, at the board level, we've asked the superintendent to, to take a very close look at the cost of utilities. And then also on the water side, you know, to identify if there's leakage and then, you know, who's, who's monitoring that, uh, you know. And so once we identify that there's a, a spike in, in, a, in a bill, we have to have some, uh, you know, um, answers to why there's a spike in the utility cost. So uh, at least from the board's perspective, I know that we're asking the superintendent to really keep a close eye on that because uh, you know, that's a big chunk of our, our budget. So I just wanted to share with the, the committee that uh, the presentation that we had from, from, uh, from GPA yesterday was an eye-opener for, for myself and I'm, I'm, uh, my colleague here. He gave us an idea of, okay, this is some of the things that we need to do in terms of, and, it, and it's a partnership with GPA. So I just wanted to share that with the committee that uh, we're gonna put that on our radar and we're gonna continue to push to have the superintendent help reduce costs uh, in utilities. Yeah, so um, actually I know your staff was aware and I wasn't able to attend, but we put it up on Facebook Live. So um, it's actually, they can, uh, they can go to our Facebook page and just you know, be able to listen to the presentation. So uh, a couple of issues, like we mentioned, the solar. So the, for, so for, so the legislation, legislature passed uh, a law that allows us to work with the um, schools, the lease schools, to install solar through a power purchase agreement. That was supposed to be a little bit, you know, more less burdened by procurement requirements since we're working with a landlord uh, technically and we're leasing from them. Uh, it hasn't passed. It didn't pass the attorney general's review, and we've, you know, for a number of reasons, and we're we're, we're hoping that we can, with the new attorney general, uh, revive this conversation. Uh, I think a lot of the discussion has centered around risk. Well, is it low enough? What happens if fuel goes up and fuel goes down? Um, my my perspective is that if you ever have uh, if we, if four of our schools have the power purchase agreement at 16 cents, which is we were negotiating around 16 cents per kilowatt hour, and the rest of the school system, uh, GPA's rates go lower, we're still going to end up in a pretty good situation. So I think it's looking at the bigger picture, and hopefully um, the Attorney General Camacho can work with us. Now the other piece of that is that the rest of the the, the non lease schools are actually under General Services Administration. So GSA has responsibility for doing that, and we don't believe that they are intending to move it forward. So I would, you know, we can maybe relook at and see how to uh, move that forward, whether through GSA or by returning it to DOE to, to uh, take that forward. This is for all the schools that are not leased, and um, we'd be happy to work on with you on looking at, at making that work. Now, with regard to water as well, Water utilization, we did buy a leak detector a couple of years ago, and we've been using that to try to deal with any of our issues that we see, any spikes in water, any uh, you know outlandish water costs, um, to try to detect the leak and then go in and repair it. And of course, as you know, just because you repaired one leak doesn't mean it's gonna stop leaking other, elsewhere, new leaks won't, ha won't, won't uh, come up. And so we are still you know challenged by an aging infrastructure uh, around water, especially in our southern schools, we're seeing things pop up that we have to then you know do as emergencies to go repair. So going forward, uh, solar. We also we talked about the GPA program. So what they're doing is their their, their focus is before going into renewables, focusing on demand site management and trying to reduce uh, costs through um, some simpler technologies. Now the problem is as you look you, know, you look at Simon Sanchez and you look at Price and other schools, they weren't really built necessarily when air conditioning was required and. And so a lot of our older schools, you'll see air conditioners because that's a requirement. Then you'll see the fact that we have all these louvers. So now we have to you know, put the, fiber, the plexiglass on the louvers and even that becomes an insulation challenge. So there's lots of different things that are happening but these schools weren't built to be you know, um, you know, energy efficient. And so that may explain some of the differences. And then the other difference might be practices. There may be some schools who are more vigilant and so uh, this is why we send their bills out to try to let them know your, your costs are out of whack and we need to address it. So the, the GPA report they provided to us, we're happy to share with the committee uh, because they did an audit of all, almost all the schools to, and with recommendations and they've costed out what they believe would be um, the worthy you know, investments that could help us save over time. 
And so uh, I, think they, I think the target reduction rate was about 30% um, to be able to save 30% through without even going to renewables by starting to do things like solar powered uh, HVAC, um, automated building systems where you, they, you know, you can through automation, you can shut things down and turn things on and, and so forth. So um, the Siemens uh, the engineering group is the, is the partner working with GPA. And uh, we're hopeful that with the pilots, there's three projects going on. Uh, two are LED lighting installations at Southern High and GW because uh, of their high costs. And then um, one project that's a more of a comprehensive project to try to d take care of all those strategies at one school at Carbolito Elementary. And the idea is to make that the model so that we can uh, make it real, that we can realize those costs and then use it as the argument to finance more investments in those e efficiency measures. May, may I add also with respect to the air conditioning, I know that th there's a re we use a lot of split units. And so that was one of the questions I had yesterday you know, is, um, you know, can we get a national brand? Because, you know, you have, of course, the lowest bidder. Uh, you got uh, different styles of air conditioners throughout the school, and then the parts become an issue, things of that nature. So, you know, is there something where, are there best practices that perhaps counterparts or aspirant uh, districts, uh, you know, the type of energy efficient air conditioners that they use so that we can run it more efficiently. For instance, we had an issue at Tumoning Elementary School where the whole system went down and it cr kind of created a, a compression issue in terms of uh, school, school uh, attendance. But uh, we're looking at these things and I think in terms of also maintenance of these uh, air conditioning units, Superintendent mentioned that, uh, you know, they had to retrofit the classrooms to basically prevent the air from seeping out. So they had these plexiglass and then also the doors. So as we start to look at, um, you know, long-term planning for facilities that are going to be coming up online, uh, you know, we want to keep a close eye in terms of the, um, you know, um, whether it be LEED certified uh, facilities uh, that are energy efficient. So um, it's it's on, our, it's on our radar, and I think this is a healthy discussion, and I'm, I'm just grateful that GPA was able to uh, partner with us to kind of show us all the schools and how they um, – the utility uh, cost could be if we were able to uh, make some changes. Thank, thank you very much for that. It's important for the community to know that um, you're, you know, the board and you know the administration is looking to fixing a lot of the disparity in utilities, and that we are being proactive. So, so thank you for your continued work. Um, I have a question about uh, the grants, right? Because when we met, I asked you. How do you supplement some of the money that the government isn't able to give you? And so you gave me a list of the different federal grants that you receive. And so you, the, one of the grants that you have, or the, perhaps the biggest grant is, um, is what? The, the, the consolidated grant of, um, say again? USDA. So is this like for insular affairs? So this is a formula grant that uh, goes out to all the states and territories uh, based on your enrollment. And uh, it's called consolidated grant because uh, most states deal with the different titles of the education you know, law. So it would be the Every Student Succeeds Act is the current law in place. Uh, but because we're territories with a lot smarter system, uh, we have the ability to consolidate all those formula. You know, so you might get a Title I, Title II you know, grant if you're a state and you would be held to the same reporting requirements and, and, and monitoring requirements for each of those titles. But because we're such a small system, uh, the law re also allows us to consolidate those funds all together into one bucket and work with uh, a, a particular dedicated program office at USDOE to manage those funds in line with the department's priorities and same accountability measures instead of the different title uh, areas. So how much does the consolidated grants? I, would, I think it's about $30 million for the, for the past couple of years. It, uh, it goes up and down depending on the appropriations. So yeah. that's been our high, about $30 million has been a pretty much our highest level. And can you just explain again what it covers? What is the... Okay, so the supplements that we're talking about, the supplemental services that we talk about are things like uh, Aspire, so the after school program for the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. um, it, an example is the teacher's assistance that it provides to our, our educators. Uh, we're able to uh, fund technology equipment uh, for students and teachers, um, supports our parent and family outreach uh, services. Um, 
we can provide a more detailed, if that's what you'd like, uh, list of the types of programs and activities that are in, uh, that are encapsulated. Um, professional development, you will typically get supported uh, out of the, the, these areas. Um, the alternative, the uh, the uh, GP Taurus Success Academy, in large part, is federally funded. Could could, alter could alternative school also be funded? The alternative, well, the well, what do you, what, yeah, I mean, alternative, alternative learning, school. yeah, whatever the you know, not your success, not the Success Academy that yeah, well, alternative. In, but can you also open another alternative? Can you open an alternative school to address the disciplinary needs of the of the schools that we? So, I, I, the answer is yes. I mean, what, I mean, I think well, I think the issue is alternative means a lot, right? It's, there's a lot of options under alternative, but um, we have the option of proposing a a uh, any type of a learning environment. I think it just has to align with the federal priorities as well. So they're going to want to. Yes, technically, but you'd have. Okay. To, I think you definitely would have to show uh, its tie-in to uh, student achievement and progression sure. and so forth. So uh, it would probably depend on how it's structured. But yes, alternative learning, you know, refers to online learning, you know, uh, credit recovery, other alternative models to the traditional school. So okay. it technically yes, I think just it, we would just. Usually what happens when we propose something is we'll run it by them and then they will say, they'll give us a sense of what needs to be incorporated to ensure that it's in alignment with uh, the federal law. Okay. And what is indirect cost? Indirect cost is the uh, federal, er, federal funds that are set aside to support kind of the back office administrative uh, functions necessary to um, operate the grant or ma manage the grant. So we have employees who are paid out of payroll. We have... A lot of our business offices handle things that are related to the grants. So, um, with a with a consolidated grant, you can you know we have a we have an office that's federally funded that manages the the grant application, monitoring, and so forth. It funds the activities and supplies and equipment, but it doesn't directly fund the uh, administrative side of it. So, every year you have to apply for an indirect cost rate, which is a percentage of your federal grant that they will allow you to. Uh, be able to use for the back office and operations. And how much, how much does, you, does DOE receive in direct costs? Yes. Funding? How much do they receive? For, for fiscal year 18, how about Yeah, I'm just trying to... Uh, a million or... About 800 to... Yeah, about 800,000? Okay. It used yeah, to be we didn't... It used to be that we didn't get much in direct costs because we had been out of... We weren't in line with the, uh, you know, the application and being able to get approval from DOI and DOE on the indirect costs. So over the past few years, we've managed to catch up and meet the requirements. So it's just now that we're starting to receive uh, the appropriate in, uh, levels of indirect costs to support uh, the fact that we're managing the grants. Okay. Um, there's been um, a concern about the... The, ex the expense used to travel. Right. And do you know how much DOE spent in FY17 for travel? Um, I could say that we there's no expenditures from our local budget. Uh, from the federal budget, uh, there are typically, we can get that, yeah, we can get that amount for you. But typically travel is built into the federal grant uh, to support whatever the activities, and it goes through the US DOE review and approval. So, so we can, yeah, we can provide so, that. So uh, in 2016, DOE spent 496 million. This is what I'm reading. Travel off island. Can you con yes. confirm that if that's incorrect? Well, we don't have 40. And then that in 2017, <laughs> I can say yes, it's not, it's not correct. Okay, and then in 2017, it was 248 thousand. Yeah, I'm sorry, 496,000. Did I say 496,000 or did I say <laughs> million? million? Oh, okay, so 496, of course, that's absolutely wrong then. $496,759 in 2016. And then in 2017, $248,607. Sure. Um, you, could you use some of this travel expense for indirect costs? Um, on or occasion. Did you use it? On you use yeah, it? on occasion you can. So... Um, for the most part, though, it's not. For the most part, it's used to um, basically fund, you know, grant activities. So you'll see a lot of t either at teacher travel or 
uh, grant office travel, when we go out to Washington, D.C. for our, our visits with uh, USDOE, it'll be included in those costs. That's almost half a million dollars in 2016. We'll be happy to break it out. And so if you, um, you, if DOE has this indirect cost and you said that it, you can use it for travel, yeah. if you pull, if you draw down the indirect cost from the, from the federal grant mm -hmm. and put it into the government uh, funding, can that become government money? Um, I don't, I would have to ask what that would be characterized okay. as. Right? Yeah, so I, I'm asking because if, if the money changes color from federal and then it becomes state once you put it into the government coffers, perhaps that money can yeah. be spent better elsewhere for the maintenance of schools or to support Timuning Elementary's um, HVAC disaster, which made them have to pull half day and then later on they had to suffer and pull right. additional day. And so can you right. look into can, that? Can we I, get a report can, on that? I can look and see whether something like that would be allowable. I mean, I think based on the numbers you're showing me, these numbers are probably right out of the grant. Uh, so we can definitely, if it's right out of the grant, it's going to be in our program application that had to go through review and approval. Or I'm thinking maybe you could use it for utilities so then you can program money elsewhere to help the other schools if it's, you know, I mean, right. perhaps one, one point some million dollars isn't significant, but I think it is rather significant if you're being told to cut $4.7 million more uh, for BBMR. Right. Um, also, I understand that this is the biggest grant that USD, uh, right. Guam DOE receives from, right. um, from our federal government. And the indirect cost is, it's, it, it has a percentage of the grant rate that you get right. and so I'm thinking that maybe you can look into options for other federal grant programs that allow you to get indirect cost so that if we again can draw down this money that's called indirect costs and then put it in the government coffers and then that government coffers can be used for state functions for example school maintenance and so forth I, yeah, as an indirect cost utilities, maybe we can yeah. look at that as well. So Because we're looking at ways, right? We're, we're, this is, has to do everything with our budget. Right. So I'm, I'm just asking if you can consider that. No, absolutely. And, so, um, I, But I just want to clarify, I mean, what the, the issue is we hadn't been drawing down indirect costs, right? So there's one, so now we are. So now that we're at this point, um, what we tried to use that is to support, uh, in large part, because we're under high risk, we've been trying to utilize uh, some of those funds to just backstop some of the training or the even the hiring of positions to support the the financial uh, positions that underscore high risk strategy. So that's you know, that's when we started to collect it. But I'm happy to report yeah. out on what some of the other options or consider the other options for yes, that. Yes, because we're looking at how the federal program supplemented DOE in right. the past right, and right. in the budget uh, aspect. But um, I, I just, but just on, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we can uh, respond and then okay. we can follow up that response or further discussion. Thank you. And then also, um, I'm really interested in this special education program as well, right? So do you, um, I understand they also get a grant, right? SPED does, yes. So SPED gets a grant. And then I was wondering, is, do you, is UOG Cedars paid to facilitate this grant? So Cedars is, uh, they are a, a major contractor under SPED, yes. Okay, and how much do they get paid? I'd have to, uh, well, we, can, we can get that to you with the report on Cedars. Because I'm thinking if, we, if uh, we outsource this grant, really, maybe we can pull back that money and use it for perhaps to hire more social workers in SPED. Uh, or teachers in, in SPED, or maybe more one-to-one -one aids in, in, in SPED. And so no, I, if, you, if you can please... Yeah, uh, I, won't, I won't speculate on what the cost is, but I'm happy to provide that once you... Just I want to make sure I get it right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Superintendent. I'd like to open it up for any of... Oh, one more question, Mr. Sharma. Um, we had to freeze increments in salaries for teachers. Yes. Uh, what, what is GFT's stance on it? What are the teachers' concerns? And... Have you been working with DOE to find a solution for this? Well, uh, the solution will be coming to the legislature to be asking that the increments be lifted um, and that we could uh, get our increments back. Okay. But just to let you know that at JFK, um, having the, the talk with the other teachers, and I do still teach at JFK, um, I've had one of um, our math teachers recently resign from his teaching position and hard to fulfill um, because there's not too many math graduates. And uh, the reason why is because he 
um, wasn't getting his increment. He was at that retirement um, age, and he just decided to retire. And there's um, talk of other teachers um, going through um, that retirement as well, especially if um, next year's budget, um, with the financial crisis that we still have, if we were to um, still maintain the increment freeze, um, I know several of my colleagues at JFK that are looking at retiring already. Um, so it, it does make it difficult to um, hire teachers knowing that they could um, receive $10,000 more simply by starting at another um, school district, um, much less Dodea um, across the fence. Um, their salary is well over $10,000 um, in difference. Thank you, sir. And I'd like to open it up now for uh, first the vice chair, if you have any. No? Okay. Uh, will you start this way? Senator Moyle. Uh, thank you. And I, I do want to support the Department of Education, of course. I'm, I've uh, attended public schools. It's great. We, we need to do a lot, a lot to really help out the schools. But one thing in particular, uh, this morning we were invited to the governor's office. Um, we had a briefing on the budget for uh, uh, this year and last year, and it, it doesn't look good at all. Right. Uh, 33% of the total funding is going to Department of Education. Well, we have a large deficit. Uh, they, on the reports I provided to you, John, just on a WhatsApp view, the slides I'm talking about, but it mentioned 890 million deficit uh, for 2017, as of 2017, I believe. The largest, of course, being in the retirement fund of $1.1 billion. It's, it's just, it doesn't look good. Um, but one of the top priorities that uh, Department of Revenue Tax wants to do is collect the taxes. We need more monies to come in so we can help Department of Education. Uh, if there was a program that the school can uh, put out there and we can certify people to become tax collectors, that would be a great business. <laughs> but but we, I, I know, and I'm sure my colleagues want, want to help you as much as we can. Uh, but BBMR on that report is also saying they want to expand cost-cutting measures too. So we're looking at more cost-cutting measures. That's their number one priority coming from our executive office. Uh, I just want to put that out there. Senator, as, do you have a question? For I, I want to make a statement. That's all. <laughs> but just say, uh, my question is, I'll be working with you. I'll find the money somehow, but I just want to do my best for you folks. But thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Senator Paris. Yeah, so I just want to uh, acknowledge I've been on those front lines and I know what, as a teacher that um, we have to pay out of pocket a lot of times to buy supplies. And I remember that time when I had to purchase my own projector and computer. And I do, I want to recall too, when you first stepped in as a superintendent, uh, you were looking for, for financing or more funding uh, from uh, our neighboring islands. And um, I, re I don't know if you recall that. Um, what was the outcome of those discussions? I'm sorry, for you, with regard to the compact, the compact right? Yeah. No, the, the issue there, I mean, you know, what we've, what we've always said is to try to figure out ways and we could support um, our school needs with regard to the impacts that we are receiving. So um, we do get DOI money set aside, but it hasn't changed, you know, from where we, where we were. I mean, we do get allocations here and there, obviously through the governor's office. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's been our kind of status quo. We are, you know, we really need to do a better job looking at how we work with our students, um, our, our students, our migrant students. Um, but I don't, I don't know, it's one of the areas that I think um, we need a lot more work, but to do a lot more work uh, on. So and I don't know if I'm, I'm answering your question. I don't, I don't think we've got additional resources dedicated just for compact impact. I think we've done our job to try to collect all the information necessary to make the argument. In fact, I think um, it was, a, you know, I think GAO had looked at the information that we've been providing from the education system and saying, this is the information that is put together, pulled together correctly in order to, you know, inc you know uh, improve our chances to get um, these issues addressed. And so we've been working with, uh, just recently with our Carlotta Leon Guerrero to maybe separate the education component, uh, that report, and utilize that as a way to try to make an argument for at least trying to get some relief on the education side. But that's been a tough one. It's a conversation with DOI. We're not normally in that conversation. But what we've tried to do is make sure we improve 
the data that we provide uh, based on what the expectation is. Um, because I think that was the issue before. They weren't getting the information in the right way. And they now they've given us, um, uh, I guess, you know, commendations for the information that we've been able to, to improve. The other thing is the FESPAC reimbursement. Uh, where was Where is that at? I'd have to look at tolling. We did we did get some reimbursement, but I don't. Uh, I, I think at the end of the day, we did get some some money from from GVB. What was the amount? About two hundred, but not full, not a full not the full reimbursement of our costs. I'd have to go back and check our files. Would it be possible to get additional money from that still, or it's already been settled? I think that's what well, I was told. That's all they had left. Okay. I don't, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta check they from GVB. Then, yeah, I think they closed the account. But that's we, oh. we did get a, um, a check from G, you know, from GVB at the end of the day, and I'll, I'd want to confirm, you know, those amounts of what was left. But uh, I, I could say that we didn't get the full amount of uh, reimbursement that uh, came out of our request. So we talked about utilities and other things that we had re um, put in our request. And regards to um, receivership, um, how does the financial status or the budget how does that impact your uh trying to uh, terminate well the it's, it's it's tough with the um it's a tough conversation so whenever there's a Gov guam issue it impacts our ability to make a, an argument about how doe is doing because uh, they pay attention to our news they pay attention to everything and then they say well you know you're in a cash crunch and you know we just got done dealing with puerto rico and now you you guys are in a in a situation where I'm hearing that they're you're doing budget cuts and so forth, and they I think they've used that as an opportunity to say, well, you know, it's going to be more tempting to use federal funds for the wrong purposes because you're going to have this pressure on the local side. So it affects that conversation. And what of course we say is that you know, look, we're not you know that's not happening. We we guide ourselves you know appropriately when it comes to using federal funds, but it does. But the whole go, you know government situation will impact that discussion because I've heard those comments. Well, you know, your government, the government of Guam is. Uh, you know, it's going through some tough times. So, you know, we're kind of concerned there's going to be a cash need and, you know, you're, you know, it gets tempting to, to sometimes, you know, sub try to find ways to use uh, federal funds in creative ways to make up for that shortfall. So we try to assure them that's not happening. It's not going to happen. We have all these checks and balances, but I think that's, that's how that some of that budget discussion happens. So we basically try, we try to just, I, I think we try to present ourselves as competent and able managers of the funds. So it, it puts us in a weird position because when it's time to cut, we try to make those adjustments proactively so that we don't end up at the fiscal year with a big hole that nobody's responsible for. Uh, but at the same time, we want to be advocates for our kids and not just cut, you know, and, and without, uh, you know, that, that concern. Um, so we try to present ourselves saying, look, look we're going to do what we need to do to manage these funds effectively and responsibly. Uh, but I, but yes, they do say they do pay attention to what's happening uh, with the overall financial situation for the government of Guam. Okay. I think that's probably why uh, they separated the responsibility for federal funds for DOE. I mean, it's, it is the responsibility for the federal funds does fall to the superintendent, which is unique amongst the rest of the government. And um, that's part of the issue of higher risk and putting us under special conditions. Um, so I'm just also uh, comparing 2019 versus 2020 levels. Um, and I see increases in um, equipment about 10 times um, from last year. And um, in our request, you know, I know you guys worked hard on the budget. Um, yeah. What is the source of that? Oh, in the, are you talking about in the request? Yes, the equipment oh. line 250. Which, which, which are you looking at, Senator? Um, the, um, the last page of the Okay. Oh, no. So that's the difference between what we were authorized and what we're requesting. Okay. So the difference is uh, there's, a, there's a, like you said, there's a, only a $20, 20 um, million dollar difference or over, or over, yeah, over that. But yeah. they, the issue is uh, a, lot of that's, a lot of that's reflected in the $17 million textbook that's included in equipment. So that makes up a large part of that request, okay. which is why it's so significantly um, high. Um, what are In your? Equipment? Yeah, it's, that's where it's categorized. Okay. Um, as far as contractual services, um, what are your largest 
uh, vendors or, or what is the breakdown of that? So food, so I'll say them and you can get, well, Tony pulls up the details, but generally it's our food services uh, contract as well as our, uh, our, H our air conditioning contract as well as our uh, custodial contract. You have the numbers. Isn't there a school, sorry, oh, it's okay. forgive me, Senator. Isn't there a school that um, did a pilot on, how, how's that going? What school it's, is that? It's a Stumbo Elementary. Okay. So, um, so while she's looking at those numbers, uh, what, they, what they asked to do was a pilot uh, custodial services uh, arrangement where they cleaned their own school and, and they wanted um, the, major, the majority of the funds that would normally have gone to the vendor. And those funds then were used to buy some of the cleaning supplies that they'll need and then uh, the rest of it that goes to them for instructional supplies and equipment for the school. Okay, very good. How much it's was that? How, what is the, how much did they manage to save just by doing that pilot? Um, and I'd have to, look, I'm going to ask Tony. I'm not sure about or the, how anyway. much did they, it's not the, a savings. Yeah, it's not a savings. It's not I, a, yeah, okay. Yeah. Let me correct yeah. myself. It's not a savings. Right. But how much did they manage to, uh, yes, it's a, what was it? Recolor, redirect. Yeah, yeah, yes. No, it's okay. a, Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. a good amount. No, they're so they're happy. This is a, yeah. this, they started it because it said goes directly to the school. Yes, yeah. and they and so they've managed to work out any issues. Uh, but the whole notion for us was to have make sure that the employees, you know, because this is um, not part of their normal responsibility, so that the employees were volunteering to do it. So we asked them to volunteer to do it if they're going to do it, and then we'd be happy to to pilot that. And so the, it then becomes a principal's responsibility to ensure that everybody's willing to do it. But in return. They um, receive, you know, the supplies and equipment that they've been yeah. asking for, and it's just done at the school level. So that's yeah. a nice thing. So this year, I think we're piloting uh, two more. Yeah. The next one, um, I think Marizzo Martyrs Elementary, and what's the other? Uh, uh, DL Paris. And DL Paris. DL Paris. Yeah. I also, yeah. if I may, I just want to also uh, was able to assist in securing some funding for one of the middle schools. They uh, through their PTO, we were able to get some brooms and mops and all those things uh, from, from a private company, donated about $3,000 worth of um, cleaning equipment to uh, middle school. So, I mean, it's catching on, and that's the direction we're hoping our community will get behind so that we can channel those resources. I mean, 30000 towards instructional materials is uh, I, I, it's helping the schools out. I just want to acknowledge your uh, efforts in cost containment that prevents furlough of teachers, because I was in the system uh, when we were, you know, that was potential, so I do appreciate that. Um, the other thing I do want to possibly work with you guys is uh, looking for ways to generate uh, revenue. And so uh, I like your ideas that you have listed here, and uh, maybe we can talk some more about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I, forgive me, I'd also like to recognize uh, Senator Shelton, who's also the co-chair for education. Um, I, I was just talking earlier that I think DOE needs two oversight chairs because this is a... <laughs> A very, very big um, agency. Can, Senator Joseph Augustine. <laughs> um, for, for the superintendent and, and his staff and the board, and for my colleagues, um, March 5th is the, is the budget hearing. You've heard some of the questions. I'm getting it, yes. Please come prepared because the budget hearing would only focus on DOE on that day. So don't think it's going to be a one hour. Schedule event. I'm I'm actually scheduling a whole full four hours. So, as this as the as my colleagues are asking questions, please take note. Bring the, all your notes. Um, I would ask them to send me whatever questions you want passed on to you, or if they send you any questions, please come prepared. Yes. Because I have questions, but I'm going to save it for that day. March fifth would be your anniversary. Okay, John. Yes. Thank you. Can I, can I? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Shelton, do you have any question? Okay. I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little bit about um, what Senator Perez was talking about. Uh, you talked about your checks and balances um, to address the high status um, and what, you're, what else you're doing to address that and a timeline for resolution. So um, we just, uh, so I think the last time we gave a public update about this, we were working with USDOE on a what's called a reconsideration evaluation plan, REP. So 
last year in, in May, we made a formal request to have our special conditions reviewed and, and possibly removed when they have to come, then they would have to come back and do this whole evaluation. So since then, we've been working on what that plan would be. And they've we've gone back and forth, uh, went to see them in December. Uh, in January, uh, they were in the middle of restructuring, so we've been waiting for a response. I just got a response last week, and I, we're about to, sh to, we haven't presented to the board yet, but essentially, and we're both happy to share with you, it's, it, it's a line items of what needs to be done in each of the general categories and areas that needs to be submitted to DOE, so um, a set of you know, uh, information that's needed. And their, their monitoring and evaluation will consist of virtual monitoring, They'll do, there are things that we'll send to them and they'll just review and get, get back to us as to whether things are in place or not. But they're planning some on-site visits as well. We don't have details on when they're going to visit. Our, our anticipation that it's going to happen this year, but it's contingent on us meeting those deadlines. Uh, our internal auditor plays a major role in doing the initial validation, and then he will send that uh, to USDOE um, for, the, for their review and it will go from there. So uh, we just got it last, late, late last mm -hmm. week and we wanted to sit down with our board and our <coughs> finance chair to go over the framework and make sure we're right. clear on it. And uh, happy to, sh I mean, it's happy to share it with anybody, but that's the, I haven't yet done that with the board. Mm -hmm. But that should give us a, a, the map through the, through the year um, and uh, to, to get them to um, come out, visit, and hopefully uh, acknowledge progress. Okay. Yeah. Can, I, can I add, um, you know, being a part of this whole process about two years ago, you know, we set an aggressive uh, an agenda, aggressive agenda to get ourselves off of high risk status. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that we're also discussing is about transition, because right now we have a third party overseeing certain things. And as we they start to wean themselves off of that oversight, you know, what is the structure going to look like for the Department of Education? So we never revert back to mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, this position. And so, of course, you know, one of the challenges we're faced with the department with our budget of course, is, you know, uh, you got current employees and some people are looking, you know, they have options that, uh, you know, sometimes we have to keep the good employees that uh, are, are really focusing their energy. And we have a really good internal audit office and they're depending a lot of that, uh, you know, a lot of the report uh, and, you know, the compliance issues regarding uh, high risk. And so, um, you know, beefing up our internal audit office is, is important, uh, getting that additional support in the HR department as well as the accounting department. Um, you know, so these are the framework in which we're kind of setting that structure so that when they leave, we have a, a framework in place so that we, we, you know, um, we don't revert back. In, the, in our discussions with our federal partners, I, I've come to the realization that you know, when everybody, you know, that one Guam approach, we, we met with the speaker, the, the chairs of the committee, the governor, the Congress uh, women at the time, we we're gonna engage with our congressmen and um, you know, to really push it from the top down and we had an opportunity to meet with the Secretary of Education and the Assistant Secretary of Education for uh, elementary and secondary. And so in those discussions, um, we, the board initially was not a part of those discussions a couple years ago. Now we're at the table and we're saying we really need to get, get ourselves off of this. Uh, you know, spending about $21 million in, in uh, you know, to, to fund uh, the third party oversight over the Department of Education is very uh, taxing and that money can be spent towards the, uh, you know, classroom. So Absolutely. Um, our board has made it a priority uh, to really go out there and advocate. And one of the things, they, they can't even travel this way. So that's one of the reasons why we go out there and we, we state the case. And while we're out there, we look at other options like the USDA um, uh, Rural Development Loan. Uh, in are terms you of traveling financing. under federal dollars? Is I, the board, are the board members traveling under federal dollars? I believe so, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's indirect costs that uh, we use because it's part of the, otherwise, I, I don't know how, yeah, there's no, yeah, I, I don't know how else to put Through our indirect case costs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with that, I just want to reassure you that uh, it's a priority for us. Thank you. Okay. okay um, just one more thing I, I wanted to clarify. Um, according to the annual state of education report in FY 2017, your local appro appropriation was Two hundred and sixty-seven million four hundred twenty-nine thousand. Less than that, but I think that, I think that, I think that takes into account some other costs that are not in the DOE budget. I'm trying okay. to. I think those are taking into account the debt service paid on the lease schools that are not in DOE. And then the school year 2017 to 2018 is 282 million. That includes federal grants. It says general okay. funds specifically. And I believe, I think I looked, looked those numbers over, but I can, I can review it. This is from the annual it. state of education right. report. 
It says general fund was given 200 for school year, not fiscal year, school year 2017 to 18. It says 282 million eight hundred thirty-nine thousand seven hundred and five. Then they have another category for federal grants, which is fifty-nine million one hundred seventy-five thousand one forty-seven, which gives the total expenditure to three hundred forty-two million fourteen thousand eight hundred fifty-two. So this is from the annual state of education report, just to bring some clarity into the uh, budget request when uh, my colleagues go in and they dissect the budget that they need to take a look at the annual state of education report also to understand some of the accounting. Uh, before we close, I'd like to thank Senator Essay for his support in, in continuing to be present for these budget hearings and also encouraging you to provide um, sure. some of the answers that we've requested for, mostly, most, spe most specifically for the indirect cost explanation, mm -hmm. um, where, because this is about uh, $700,000 in travel. So oh, from, okay. from, fiscal year 2016 and 17 so let me yeah, I don't I don't know that that's accurate but if you allow me to uh, go confirm and verify what the true numbers are we'll absolutely I got do it that. out of your uh, one of the grants we'll take it we'll take a the, look and yeah, so it doesn't so, doesn't sound right that's a lot of, that, so, that's almost the entire amount of yeah, well, for so, one. so so it was um, indirect cost was 905,180 for 2016 and then 2017 the indirect cost was 455147 and then it stated that the travel total for 2016 was 496759 and then yeah, 2017 was 248607 so yeah, i'm just sounds, saying it, that yeah. sounds like it's more across the bigger so grants. maybe you can clarify okay. that yeah. um, and um, yes yeah, so if we could repurpose that uh, if if there's a possibility right if the indirect cost comes that. is drawn sure. down and it's put in, in the government coffers that this government money be used perhaps for indirect costs such as paying utilities so that you can utilize that money elsewhere. Okay, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues for coming. If I could, one just, and I was just trying to pull up the numbers because I, I didn't want to okay. leave this without the, uh, um, the look at the, the financials on the, on the sure. federal. But I do want to, so we want to take a look at that. I, I did break it down and I'll, I'll respond to that in, in writing. Okay. Uh, but there is an appropriations. Uh, some of the amounts that are set aside for the leases, lease payments that are not in our normal budget might be included in that. In the indirect costs? No, in the talk, I'm talking about the uh, ASPR. The, yeah, the... Which one? The uh, ASPR in the annual report that you were citing, the total oh, amount. Oh, the annual state of education right. report. So I, I, what I'll do is I'll break that down because I don't want to leave the impression that, that was the, those are amounts for to deal with. Some, okay, so great, the, yes. So the federal funds, of course, are allocated also to non-public schools, so private mm -hmm. schools and charter schools take advantage of that. So it reflects the state level, you know, mm -hmm. these are the costs, but they're actually not all DOE. So I, we'll okay. go in and we'll oh, break okay. that down to make sure. I just don't want to leave the impression that those are all kind of DOE okay. uh, context, but they'll probably take some explanation and notation. Please. Yes, because um, in table that. 39 and table 40, table 39 is, um, it includes JROTC programs and consolidated right. grant and special education right. grants. And then table 40 represents per pupil um, based on audited expenditure of local funds. Right. So the general, uh, yeah. So, we're, so definitely, yeah. Right. So those look like, they'll just, we'll just break it down okay. so that, uh, thank you. You can, uh, and can, then we will also yeah. do, uh, a separate hearing, okay. um, informational hearing with our charter schools. Okay. Yes. And there's one point we are, are we're going to hold a work session with everything that you brought up. Okay. And that discussion will be public. Our okay. meetings are open and will be on Facebook Live, so you won't have to wait for the information uh, to, to come down. We'll make sure that discussion continues. Okay, great. So uh, when you have the work session, can you just... Absolutely. Okay. It's always publicly I, announced. Thank I just, you. I'll just remind you, March 5th is the budget hearing. Yes, sir. You can Thank publish you, anything you want on Facebook on March 5th. <laughs> you come to this hearing and you answer for it Absolutely. up front. Okay? Absolutely. So Thank you, you have a nice workshop. Thank you, Senator Joe. This now concludes our informational hearing. Thank you, everyone. It is now 4.40 p.m. Have a good day. God bless.